That's great. Well, we're going to get started, and thanks everybody for uh, Friday in February. So it's a great uh, privilege and pleasure to uh, introduce Dr. Patrick Parfrey, and he's come all the way from Newfoundland, having dug himself out of uh, 139 centimeters of snowfall and five days of uh, quarantine but not for coronavirus, which is great. Um, and pa uh, many of you know Dr. Parfrey, he's a clinical epidemiologist and nephrologist at Memorial. Uh, he has a number of uh, many awards and has been a real force in the world of anemia and clinical trials in Canada uh, over the last 30 years. Uh, importantly, he's an offer, officer of the Order of Canada, both for medicine and for rugby, and that's quite a distinction to have it twice, and also a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. And uh, thank you for coming and having a thoughtful discussion about RCTs and anemia. Hello, everybody. Um, I'll be coming here for 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> might be the last time, but anyway, um, I'm, I'm going to kind of look at this topic from a, from a, from a methodological, historical type of perspective. Um, I was born in 1950, and 1950 was the start of the modern era of medicine, uh, with the development of antibiotics and drug companies get de being developed to, to make these antibiotics, and uh, the framing and study being started, and risk management being introduced. And I went to medical school in 1968. That was when the dialysis started, really, and when transplantation started in Canada. So it's within a very short period of time that there's been a lot of things happened. And at that time, people died from kidney disease. All people died from kidney disease. And then I went to uh, train in nephrology at a time when dialysis was being developed to go to the masses, but it was rationed. So people who were over the age of 55, 55 died, and uh, transplantation was limited. Um, and uh, the people in dialysis units were pretty sick and pretty anemic and got lots of blood transfusions. And the anemia problem was, uh, was front and foremost from the beginning because hemoglobins dropped as low as six. And the issue became what to, what to do with, the, with it, and, and it's become a a consistent problem in end-stage kidney disease, but less of a clinical problem in my mind. It's gone from a major clinical problem to uh, treating, a, treating a blood level. So uh, I'm going to try and do my talk around the use of transfusions, erythropo erythropoiesis-stimulating agents, iron, and hypoxia-inducible factor stabilizers, which is the most recent kid in the block. Um, there, are st there are still research issues, and uh, if you have to contemplate that clinical epidemiology as a science has not really been started until 1980 and uh, developed bit by bit over time, and uh, we have a much firmer grasp on what's going on in, in, from the perspective of researching patients, uh, but I think that it's still, in nephrology in particular, is not patient oriented, it's number oriented and needs to change. So here are the research issues that I've outlined um, for, for, for discussion over the next hour. So are dialysis dependent ESRD and pre-dialysis CKD different clinical states? And I think they are. So, so you've got a situation where people with stage three chronic kidney disease gradually evolve into people who are getting more hypertension, the effect of diabetes being bigger, etc. but they are still probably part of the general population. Then we get to stage five disease, we've got the advent of severe anemia, severe salt and water overload, um, the, the fistula, um, two, two, three times a week dialysis, immunosuppression, so I think that they're different clinical states. And studies that try to combine them are in error, I think. And then there's, there is even now, there is a definition of what is anemia. So is it, is it a result below normal for that particular group of people, men and women, been different? Or is it, is it driven by um, how we treat them? So I've, I've, in effect, I've come up with some definitions that relate to how we treat them. So severe, less than nine grams per liter, because there's a substantially increased transfusion risk. Um, so that, that's a reason why we would 
treat anemia. Moderate, moderate anemia, 9 to 12 grams or 9 to 11.5, that's the way we treat, uh, use erythropoietin to initiate therapy and target therapy. Um, and then what about the anemia that's below, say, 13 as a cut point, where people have symptoms? Do we define that as being anemic or not? Or do we define people who have no symptoms but their hemoglobin levels between 12 and 13? Still out there. And I think it's going to become, come, bec become more uh, uh, relevant with the onset of these HIF stabilizers. If, if the HIF stabilizers are, uh, haven't got very many side effects, well then we'll start treating people to higher levels of hemoglobin. And then we still have this issue of modern medicine. Are we treating the patient or the laboratory value? And before you had anything to provide like drugs or dialysis or transplants, you treated the patient. And uh, the doctor was compassionate and thoughtful and spoke to the patient because there's nothing else to offer. Now we, we, now we do a batch of testing uh, without talking to the patient virtually. We triage them in the emergency room with, with uh, a quick few questions. They get a batch of testing, including CT scans or ECGs or everything. Hardly, hardly, hardly spoken to the patient. And there's little doubt that the way we treat dialysis patients is driven by the way we're paid. We, to get paid, we have to see the patient. There's so many patients. You're not going to speak to very many of them for, for very long. You're going to skip by a batch of patients. And probably you haven't uh, understood how the patient is at any stage of the dialysis life because they haven't sat down in a private area and spoken to you about themselves. So the reality is, I think, in, in our dialysis group that we're treating the laboratory value and not the patient. So what would be important patient-related outcomes? Again, definitions are relevant. We're, we're driven now by the Kinepi mace protocol, major cardiovascular events, drives nephrology trials. It's probably not the most important thing that affects our patients, but that's what, that's what drives the trials. And we're mixing up clinical, outcome, clinical events that are caused by uh, atherosclerosis and by non-atherosclerosis things. So by that I mean the outcome of atherosclerosis in the heart is a myocardial infarction. It's probably caused by narrowing of the coronary arteries and it's probably got a pathogenesis that's different from the onset of uh, heart failure, which is uh, frequently non-atherosclerotic and maybe uh, systolic dysfunction or diastolic dysfunction. So there are two different pathogenic mechanisms that we mix up in MACE and therefore probably prevent us from seeing, being a bit, from seeing more specific outcomes that may respond to the therapy. And in particular, if you take anemia therapy, I've always been at a loss to work out how anemia could affect atherosclerosis, but I could understand how it could affect non-atherosclerotic disease. The vascular access is, a, is an, a major component of the patient's life on dialysis. And a, a, a risk to the, to the vascular access is a big event. And we tend to underestimate the size of that safety issue. And then quality of life is, uh, for our patients who live a relatively short period of time, is the most important thing for them. But as nephrologists, we, we ignore it. We ignore it in the trials, we ignore it in the appreciation of the outcomes of the trials, and uh, we write it off by saying, ah, the data is not good enough, or we don't know how to, you know, we're not measuring it very well. It's, uh, I'm going to deal with some of that stuff, because I believe that quality of life is measurable, it's clinically important, and uh, should be an outcome that we take uh, an interest in. So ergo, what are the issues about measuring quality of life? Well, study design is clearly important. Um, when you measure it, is the patient blind to the intervention? And is the investigator blind to the intervention? And if neither of those things are present, the, the uh, data that you're collecting is biased. Then the next thing is, have we got valid instruments? And I would argue that the SF36 is a valid instrument used across multiple diseases which contain domains that are relevant to the management of anemia. The KDQ was developed to do an anemia trial, um, and it goes across multiple domains, but is reported as one score. 
And clearly, when, when you deal with patients and you ask them how their life is and how they're getting on socially and how they're getting on emotionally and how some of the symptoms are relevant to dialysis, they're different domains. And adding these up and saying that's the outcome is stupid. Um, and then there are certain other types of questionnaires that measure things that are specific to anemia therapy, like the FACT fatigue score that comes out of the oncology literature. It's got a, sec a, a collection of questions that are asked about fatigue and its impact on the patient. And I think it is probably a reasonable measure whether the patient has got fatigue or not. So in terms of, in terms of uh, um, designing the trial, uh, you do need predetermined domains. Like it's, it's illogical to think that the totality of the quality of life included in the SF36 or the KDQ would, uh, be, would respond to a, a thing that's, that's focused on, on a specific component of biology that expresses itself in patients that are in a, in a particular set of symptoms and then say that the totality of a score is what we're interested in. That's kind of stupid. So I think predetermined domains is a, is a way to go. You create your question around the data you've got, and is there data to suggest that particular domains are responsive to the therapy that you're interested in? There are, there are issues that relate to dropout, dropout for the intervention, but also dropout from doing the questionnaire, and, and, and the fact that it's done over a substantial period of time. So a trial that has four years duration, the dropout is going to be really substantial, and it's highly likely that the data that's collected in the last two years is irrelevant. That is just, so to, to get an, a, 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 um, a revelation on the impact of your therapy, you're better off de 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 determining what period of time you're going to examine. And then um, missing data courses are very substantial, and, and really what happens is that the computer guesses what the data should be, but of course that's not. If that's if that's a big issue, the, 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 it's a major limitation. Then you've got what, what what's called seeming effect. But in in simple terms, what that means is that if somebody comes in like the majority of us and our quality of life is normal, then we're at our ceiling. We can't get better. But we we mix in when we analyze the data all those patients whose quality of life is normal with the people who have abnormal quality of life and dilute the effect of the intervention. And we reported and saying, we just added all up together, I mean, here's the score, here's the standard deviation, it's no different from that, there's nothing happened. But that's, that's probably not the reality. Um, and then the issue of clinical significance of change in the scores is relevant to how you translate the results of the trial. So unless you can prove to the guys who are, who are going to treat the patient that this change in score has got clinical significance to the patient, you're not going to get any pickup. And there's been big problems with the translation of the change in the scores to the clinical significance. And when there is a definition made, the definition made of clinical significance is really based on very poor data. So even that piece is grounded in sand. And then finally, um, how you analyze the data re re requires a degree of sophistication because there are things like intercurrent events that dominate quality of life for a period of time. But if you get a stroke, that dominates everything, no matter what, and dominates for a substantial period of time. If you get a heart attack, that dominates things for six months, and then disappears. So the, the, the capacity to do regression analysis uh, on the things that in, can include, uh, include uh, have an impact on quality of life together with your intervention is important. So that degree of sophistication in analyzing it is not done. And I'll present you with, a, with, a, with some information. So let's go back to the, virtually the beginning. And uh, so di dialysis, as I mentioned to you, started in the late 60s in Canada and uh, people were put on transplantation. And decisions were made uh, really ad hoc. So if you had to go back and deal with, so we, we have no idea of the relative benefit of dialysis and transplantation. We've never ever randomly allocated patients, patients to one or the other. 
No, no idea of the difference between PD and, and uh, hemo, because we've never randomly allocated them. And we still, we, we still allocate patients to these interventions when we really don't know what the effect is. So let me give you one example. This is the exa and it's an anemia example, because the problem with transfusions is that early on they carried viruses and uh, had consequences that were unknown. And we still get patients who come in with, with viruses and we still treat them based on our best guess. So we don't do what oncology does, which is batches groups of patients who've got particular risk factors and randomly allocate to a particular treatment. And when you randomly allocate to dialysis or transplant, there are huge interventions. But we're doing a lot of it based on, oh, we, we know. Well, so we knew when we did this, when this study came out, this is, you can see there, 1984. This is, I went to Montreal in 82. And uh, within that unit, uh, the transplant unit that I was at, they had dialyzed patients with hepatitis B positive disease, or had transplanted patients with hepatitis B positive disease. No, they, the argument was, well, the immunosuppression would help them. They'll do far better. So this is what actually happened. But the doc there, Gutman, Dr. Gutman, had the, uh, had the, the uh, insight that he was going to take biopsies of these patients at intervals. So there were 22 immunosuppressed transplant recipients who were hepatitis B positive at the Vic in Montreal. Um, they were followed for 12 to 8 years. So you had people who were transplanted in the, in the early 70s. Uh, and I got interested in it because a patient came into our service with a hepatoma, um, which is a pretty unusual thing, at least it was then. And this was the outcome. The data had never been looked at, but this was the outcome. Patients had their outcome of their pathology was the vast majority had aggressive active disease with the likelihood they were going to develop symptoms related to their hepatitis rather than their transplant. But did that answer the question? Well, there was no control group. There was no random allocation. This, it was fantastic. It was done. But it wasn't clinical epidemiology. It was description. So we went back and went through the dialysis unit in, and we found patients who are hepatitis B positive and not transplanted. But how, is that good as a control group? Well, probably not. They're selective not to get dialysis because they were too sick to get a transplant. Or they were selected to get dialysis because they were too sick to get a transplant. So in the, in the control group who would be dialysis patients with hepatitis B positive disease, um, we determined that there was nobody died from hepatitis-related outcomes, whereas in the transplanted group, the risk of death from liver disease was 5% per patient year. Mm -hmm. Now, the risk of death in the dialysis group would be approximately 15, 20, depending on what type of patient you had. We couldn't say from this study that it was better to transplant mm -hmm. people, transplant people with hepatitis B disease than leave them on dialysis even though we were able to demonstrate an adverse outcome of the hepatitis. So that was kind of, I won't call it my first exposure, but an initial exposure to the clinical epidemiology of clinical events that occur in patients who have got end-stage renal disease and partly related to anemia. And I'm using it as, a, as a, um, an example of where the state of play was in clinical epidemiology in the early 80s. Now, this study, can you see the date, 1990? So erythropoietin was developed very rapidly as a, uh, um, a substance that could, we knew that erythropoietin made the hemoglobin go up, but making it was another matter. And it was very rapidly made uh, following its determination of its structure. And Canada was the place that it was tested. Um, and the, it was a double blind, placebo-controlled trial, randomizing patients to EPO, uh, with what the control group being transfused, the intermediate group getting a hemoglobin target of 95 to 110, and the third group getting 115 to 130. Look at the number of patients, 180. Now, that, that's, that, I think this is the best trial that's been done in anemia. And all it took was 180 patients. And the reason that it's so... Uh, influential 
and still is influential. It, deter it determines what happens. We're, 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 it's just a, one reason why we treat anemia that makes sense. The patients who entered the study, this was in the 80s now, were young, quite a number in nephric because they had, they had anemia. Uh, but look at the number of transfusions in the previous year they were getting, 6.5 per year. Look at the baseline hemoglobin, 70. So we're different, we were dealing at that time, dealing with a different population to what we're dealing with now. And the data was incontrovertible, just 180 patients. 58% in the placebo group got a transfusion in the six weeks after the trial started. 58% in the intermediate hemoglobin group, it was 3.5%, and the high hemoglobin was 26 So there's the reason why we treat anemia, to prevent blood transfusions. Because blood transfusions carry disease, they're hard to get, and there's a huge sit situation set up to, to provide blood, and it's intermittent, and you get cycling of the hemoglobin, et cetera, et cetera. So that piece of data is what is really the, the central piece of the anemia story. Now, what about the uh, quality of life piece, which should, to me should be the next central piece? And again, there was incontrovertible data that demonstrated that treating them with EPO to either an intermediate level or a high level was uh, uh, a clinically important effects on the physical scores and the fatigue scores, both important symptoms of the patient. And why I'm saying incontrovertible was that the doctors that read, the doctors that treated their patients, they knew they got better. They, would, they could go in there and the patients say, oh God, I feel so much better. This was the uh, physical evidence that the scores provided, uh, demonstrated that there was benefit, and the docs bought it because they could see it. So there was no issue about that really at that time. So th there was a, uh, a big jump into using erythropoietin. But it had a side effect, which was clotting. And in this study of 180 patients, those allocated to EPO, 11 of uh, um, 78, uh, d developed a excess clotting against 3%, 5.6% increased risk. So the, that harm was ignored much more because of the quality of life benefits. People felt it was worth the trade-off because people felt so much better. Right, now let's move on. Here's 98. So that study stimulated the question, shouldn't we be getting people to a hemoglobin level that's normal? And the uh, Canadian study is published in 1990. This is published in 1998. So the, 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 la the story wasn't, uh, wasn't, sta it wasn't static, it was moving. It takes years to do the trial. So there was no big delay in trying to determine whether a normal is compared to a low hematocrit in patients with cardiac disease. And the patient, cardiac disease patients were picked because it felt that uh, correction of anemia would prevent cardiac disease or, or improve cardiac disease, particularly those with heart failure. And it was a randomized trial. And now look at the numbers, 1,233 patients with prior congestive heart failure or ischemic disease done in the US, the primary outcome of death are MI. And you can see how the patients have changed. 65 years of age now, um, predominantly diabetic, cause of diabetes was 44%, and everybody had underlying cardiovascular disease, because that's how you got into the trial. And the outcomes were, the trial was stopped early. Now, I was chair of this data monitoring committee at that, uh, for this at and was, had responsibility for the group and staff in the study. And people often said, well, why the hell did you stop the study? So look at the data. So there was a 30% increased risk of death or MI in the group that was randomly allocated to the normal hematocrit value, 30%. At the time, we started, but didn't reach statistical significance. So you'd say, well, why, why do it? There was a substantial difference in the transfusion issues, which is going to persist whenever you treat anemia. But it was the vascular access thrombosis was the thing that initiated the cessation of the study. Because in our mind, that was a safety issue that patients didn't like, didn't want, and caused adverse consequences of the patient. So the likelihood of demonstrating that the intervention was beneficial 
uh, when, it was, when, it, when it was 30% in the wrong direction, together with a safety signal that was substantial and important to the patient, it was decided to stop the trial. In terms of quality of life, there was a sig clinically significant increase in SF36 physical function score. Um, that's kind of been a little bit ignored. In other words, that there are patients within the study who got a clinical benefit from going from 11, between uh, 10 and 11.5 up to 13. Now, I'm not going to spend very long on these three studies here, um, the, the, but they, they were studies that were done subsequent to the normal and adequate trial in three different countries. Canada and Europe was one. Europe was CREATE and CHOIR was in the United States. And they examined normalization of hemoglobin. Uh, and they were all multi-center studies. The study that we were involved with uh, had a primary outcome of a echo outcome because the sample size estimate, 596, was not going to give you a clinical outcome, despite the fact that the Europeans decided created a clinical outcome, they had more traction because their primary outcome was clinical, but it was unattainable with the sample size. The, the, the most important uh, thing here was that there were signals, if you go down to the adverse events in the three studies, so in our study, there were 12 verse in the normal hemoglobin versus four cerebrovascular events, statistically significant. And we undersold it, because we were saying, good Christ, I mean, how could that happen? So we reported it, and there was a small number of events. But as you know from, a pre from subsequent events, this was actually very important. Um, no difference in, in the pri primary outcome for CREATE, and CHOIR reported a difference in the primary outcome. Um, I, I won't go into criticism of it, but the other, other piece of it was, was that in general, there were signals that the normal hemoglobin in the group had better outcomes in quality of life, but uh, look at the top thing. The CREATE and CHOIR were open label, biased. The, uh, the, our study was double blind, was therefore unbiased, and would provide better uh, impression of whether or not there were domains of quality of life that improve with the normalization of hemoglobin. Now, the reason that I'm going into this is that we are all exposed to patients who've got, say, I feel my, when my hemoglobin drops below 11, I feel very tired. And even people who say, well, I really want my hemoglobin in, in 125. I feel far better able to go to work. It happens all the time. At least it happens to me all the time. And the data supports the fact that these people are not telling lies. So you're, you're left with the, the uh, harms versus benefit equation for individuals in deciding on what you're going to do. This is the CREATE data, and there was kind of big changes in quality of life in CREATE, but it was, it was open, open label across several different domains. The consistent ones are physical and vitality. They're the, the, phys, the domains of the SS36 that consistently responds to normalization of hemoglobin. And then this, in our study, that here's the uh, vitality, I think it is, and you can see that in the first, uh, four to, uh, first um, year, there were significant changes in vitality scores. Now, look at 2009. So c c c the, this study was in progress when these other three smaller studies came out. So it wasn't, they weren't done in response to creator. They, they were, the, the TREAT study was set up years before that. And in fact, in this study, we had trouble getting people, particularly nephrologists in Canada, <coughs> didn't want to enter patients into our study because they said, oh, no, no, we, we want to have hemoglobins that are normal, right? And, and they wouldn't enter patients in. Then when the, the, those other three studies came out, we now had these nephrologists say, oh, no, no, we can't have people in our study because we want them to have low hemoglobins, right? So we finished the study anyway because there was still equipoise. We didn't know the answer in a placebo-controlled manner, and people, before they went into dialysis, whether or not they got a benefit or a harm from normalization of hemoglobin. So this is TREAT. Look at the size of the study here. Is the number up there? Well, it's... Uh, well, it was nearly 4,000 patients. And uh, 
this, I think this is the next best study because it's placebo controlled in a group of people in whom you could actually placebo control. And the, there was no benefit to normalization of hemoglobin. There was no adverse effect either on cardiovascular events other than stroke. So the signal that came out of our study in 2005 was replicated in this particular study. You can see that the, the risk is twofold greater, but the, the, the confidence was range from 1.4 to 2.7. And most of the risk is in people who already had uh, uh, evidence of a stroke. So when I'm coming back to the harms and benefits, and you, you apply this data in black and white to your patients, I'm not sure you're doing them a great service. Because if you've got somebody who's at work, who's 40, who is uh, probably going to get a transplant, who says, I do better when my hemoglobin is between 12 and 13, and they have no cardiovascular disease, I, I, if it was me, and uh, John, do you ever hear Joan Alamo, the rugby player from New Zealand, played in the World Cup, got end-stage renal disease, wanted to play in the World Cup in 2003, and we were asked what we should do about his hemoglobin, we said give it to him to normal levels, right, despite this data, this type of data. <laughs> <laughs> right, so, um, so this is the, this is, now here's the piece about quality of life and treat the patient and not the number is here's the way this data was reported in the New England Journal of Medicine. So you've got week 13, week 25, week 49 here, right? You can see that the study went up as much as six years. This is the fact fatigue score, and this is the proportion of patients with what's considered a clinically significant score. And you can see that this, the number of people uh, that had a benefit in the intervention group was bigger than in the control group, but not by a large amount, right? So us, in our wisdom, decided that this is a modest benefit. But who are we to talk? Like, is this, is this first of all, we, def we came up with a predefined definition based on bullshit, right? The, the, evidence, <laughs> the evidence to say that this is a clinically significant change is built on sand. And then we decided that we were going to take a very simplistic approach and report in this manner. And based on our, uh, what would I call it, our simplicity, let's say, we reported it. And based on the simplicity of nephrologists, they ignored it because we did. But, but when you do a regression analysis, I'm sorry, no, this, this is taken directly out of the journal. So there's a regression analysis, and entered in the regression is a randomization to DARBO here. This is, I think, is the fact fatigue score. And these are the covariates that were entered in, which included baseline covariates and covariates that occurred post-randomization. And you can see here that an interim stroke had a very substantial effect on the, uh, on the treat scores over time, um, five-fold increase. Uh, our five-fold five deterioration in fatigue scores as a result of a stroke, that's massive. But when you go and look at the darbo poetin score being, uh, being allocated to the intervention group, had a regression there of uh, plus 1.00. Here is uh, a history of cardiovascular disease. Look at the size of the regression. It's the identical. So, you, you, if you told me that people who had cardio, cardiovascular disease in pre-dialysis patients and they considered that the intervention was just as important as them having cardio cardiovascular disease, I'd say that's clinically important. And when you look down through the size of the regression, look at pulmonary disease, a little bit, it's slightly worse in terms of the size of the regression, etc. So if you took, if I was to say I can take away your pulmonary disease and give you erythropoietin, would you take that trade? Of course you would. So I, I believe that the sophistication of our analyses was so simplistic that we've misrepresented the results of this trial. Now, here is a, another outcome of this trial, which was published in the New England Journal and shouldn't have been, because and I, I'm, I'm in, a member of this, this team now at this stage uh, as well, right? So here you have the quartile of response to the first two doses of, uh, of uh, Darby Poetin, and uh, they're in quartiles. Here is the hemoglobin level, and here's the Darby Poetin level. 
And these quartiles demonstrate that uh, there are people who get little EPO and lots of hemoglobin. And then the other quartile gets lots of EPO and no response, virtually. Right now, if, you, if I give you that, I can give you that slide out of every single hemoglobin study, out of every single uh, qu quantity of dialysis study, I give you the identical uh, slide. You give, you've got people who get more dialysis than the other, uh, than in the randomized trial, they get more dialysis, but they're represented by people who have comorbidity. What would your interpretation be? But my interpretation is, is that this is driven by comorbidity, right? That people who have comorbidity don't respond to EPO, therefore they need more EPO to get their hemoglobin up, and they don't get their hemoglobin up terribly far here, this group here. So I would say logically, there's definitely going to be a relationship between the EPO levels and the outcome of the patients, which, which is guaranteed to occur, right? Here is the rate of endpoints. And adjusted, this is the rate per 100 patients, 12.3 in the placebo, 16.3 in the poor response, 12.4 in the better response, similar to placebo, relative risk of 30% greater, statistically significant, ergo, high EPO is bad for you. Bullshit. It is. And it got published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And it's what's driving our, our decisions around how we use EPO. We're afraid to use high levels of EPO based on this. Bad science. Now, here we are, 2019. So th this trial was driven by the report from KDGO in 2012 that provided guidelines to the use of erythropoietin uh, and based on driven to a fairly major extent by the results of TREAT, these guidelines were. And to, to use EPO, you needed to provide iron. And uh, there was one study of 100 patients in whom they identified this issue of functional iron deficiency and that there are patients who have got ferritins that are 400 and they don't have much of a response to intravenous iron, or, or sorry, they have a response to intravenous iron, and therefore we, the KDGO uh, people recommended that yeah, maybe you should make sure they're replete with iron based on this poor, non-randomized study. So it was opinion driving a guideline based on non-randomized data. But this guy, McDougall, went back to England and then set up a trial. Here you go, 2012 to 2019, pretty good timeline. He, as soon as the recommendation came out, he set the trial up, takes time, and compared did a non-inferiority open-label blinded endpoint evaluation of intravenous iron to a ferritin of less than 700 or transept greater than 40 compared to people who had a reactive iron pr uh, protocol where if the ferritin fell below 200 iron was given or the transept fell below 20%. That was the, the tested proactive intravenous iron. Now, one thing you should know is that if you give intravenous iron to, to anybody, you're going to put the hemoglobin up, right? That's going to happen. So they 2,000, 21,000 or 2,100, 41 incident hemo patients, all in the United Kingdom. Primary outcome was death or CV event. Remember, it's a non-inferiority trial, so they couldn't kind of claim a benefit here. It wasn't the primary outcome, so to speak, for so it was a non-inferiority trial. There was a benefit to giving the intravenous iron based on this primary outcome. And some of the and when you looked at recurrent events, the benefit was even greater. And when you looked at some of the secondary outcomes, like myocardial infarction and heart failure, <coughs> the relative risk was 0.66 for heart failure. It didn't happen by chance. And it's consistent with the data that comes out of non-kidney patients who've got heart failure and were given intravenous iron. Uh, they found no differences in the quality of life, but their analysis of the quality of life was like uh, taking the data and smashing it with a hammer and saying, oh, no, there's nothing there. <laughs> so it's being reanalyzed. And there was a statistically different uh, benefit because the hemoglobin went up uh, in transfusion rates. I think that's a pretty good trial, actually. And, uh, and I think that currently we should be ensuring that people are iron replete. Now, 
So the next one is the uh, hip stabilizers. So you know the background. It's a magic story. Uh, I, ca I can still remember the data being presented at the Royal Society by a fellow called Patrick Radcliffe. Pat is it Radcliffe? Patrick? And, uh, Pat uh, and it doesn't matter. Peter. Peter Radcliffe and Patrick, doesn't matter. It's name gone out of my head. Saying that uh, you can get EPO out of cells within the kidney by blocking this particular mechanism, which was a hydroxylase mechanism. And within a short period of time, 15 years, there's random, huge randomized trials been done across the world on trying to demonstrate whether these the agents that stabilize HIF and subsequently increase endogenous erythropoietin could be beneficial in patients. And this is what the, he got the Nobel Prize for. And of course, what my interest is, is translating it into clinical practice. So this came out in 2019. Again, it's a very rapid translation of basic science into clinical practice. Chinese study, the outcome, just a change in hemoglobin, a number, right? Could we, could we use this agent like we use EPO, change the number? Not whether there's a benefit to the patient. Um, it's oral roxadustat versus erythropoietin by three times a week to get a hemoglobin 10 to 12. And this target is driven, is driven by the FDA applying the data from EPO to the hip stabilizers which is probably not appropriate. There are other benefits that are all numbers. I'm not going to worry about that. And then here's Roxa do that. So, so that Roxa worked in the dialysis patient, got the hemoglobin up. And then in non-dialysis patients, at same thing, two to one oral Roxa versus placebo, double blind for eight weeks, and then everybody's put in Roxa do that. 154 patients, 29 sites in China. Outcome is, could you get the hemoglobin to go up? Yes, you can. Something, other things change, but clinically, we don't, know what, we don't know whether it's a benefit to the patients. But it looks like on paper that there's an agent, Roxadustat, that can increase the hemoglobin uh, in a similar manner to that of erythropoietin. So here we are now in 2000, and this is 2018. I want you to look at a few things. This is non-dialysis trial Seroxadustat. Um, this is the company doing it. This is where it's located. Um, the, the, here is the, the, uh, here's the uh, design, right? Double blind, double blind, double blind. E excellent, right? So they're testing the agent uh, uh, in placebo compared to Roxadustat and people before they go on dialysis. Look at the, but, but look at the, the end, the, um, the primary endpoint, right? Here's MACE as a primary endpoint. Who's doing quality of life? This one is, small number. Uh, I don't think this one is, right? So what you're looking for is, is quality of life been measured? And this has been done in a double blind fashion and is a placebo controlled. So if you can get that, the, those three pieces, you'll get the answer. And then the last thing is, can you analyze it in a sophisticated manner? Sorry. This is dialysis patients. And note now that when you look at the um, double blind, yes, yes, no, no yes, yeah, sorry, yes. The primary endpoint is the hemoglobin response. And there's <coughs> some measurement of uh, SS36 in this double blind placebo controlled trial. There's another agent called that produced that. So I, I'll go back just one sec. I want to show you something. Uh, is the numbers of patients. 900, 600, 3,700, right? There's lots of patients, right? So you're going to get good data because there's lots of patients. But you're not going to get the answer to some really important questions. Now let's go to that produced that. Here we've got, uh, I can't see it very well, but uh, double blind, no, no. Um, numbers, massive. Quality of life, yes. But it's not, it, they, these are open label. Right, where's the, where's the uh, right, they're open label studies. 
Right, this is uh, another one. Number of patients here is 300. Now I'm going to the last one. That do that. And you've got uh, 1,000, 2,000, 450, 250 uh, trials, not double blind, and uh, none of them are doing quality of life. So really what's happening is, is that the, the, uh, um, what's the word, the science or the, the, uh, the paradigm in which we're building these trials is based on the paradigm that has evolved from the use of erythropoietin. That the outcome that people are interested in is a number, that the effect on the patient is irrelevant, and that the only thing that's important to the drug companies are MACE. In other words, to make sure that MACE doesn't go up, that there's not a safety issue. And then if, we, if we're prepared to work on a number, we'll give the drugs based on the fact that the number went up. I don't think that's good medicine. In all honesty, I don't. So the, the, the trials will show an improvement in hemoglobin. We know that based on the small numbers that have been reported. It will prevent transfusions because when the hemoglobin is up, it prevents transfusions. No matter what makes it goes up, every time the transfusion rate uh, gets lower, the more the higher the hemoglobin. And when to start therapy if based on the treatment of modern anemia, yeah, we'll have people with modern anemia enter the study and the hemoglobin will go up. So we know that. But will there be improvement in patient recorded outcomes or in quality of life? We probably won't know that. Will it prevent CV events? I probably know that because, but, but, they've mixed up atherosclerotic and non-atherosclerotic events. So there's, we, we will almost certainly require a patient level meta-analysis across the three companies that are doing these randomized trials to get a proper answer on whether or not it prevents CV events or causes CV events. Will we know on whom to limit therapy? Like, are, will we know if who it harms? Not on the numbers available. If, they, if you have meta-analysis, you get a better bet. Should hemoglobin be normalized? You won't know that because they're not allowed to go above 12. What about long-term safety? So you've got this ubiquitous um, catalytic system within cells that's getting blocked by these agents in every, every uh, uh, organ of the body. The long-term safety will not be uh, addressed. Um, and, of course, the long-term safety is that if you get... 5% of people getting a cancer or 5% getting a stroke and it occurs over 5 or 10 years, you won't know it from these particular trials. Now, that's really not a criticism, it's just a limitation. That's just a fact of life. But what you can see here in terms of the information I've provided is that the anemia story has gone from, uh, has, has, has examined four different agents. It's done so in pretty good numbers of patients. We've got large numbers of patients. It's focused on numbers, it's not focused on patient-related events, and it doesn't give us the opportunity of being able to say, well, I know that that woman who's complaining about her tiredness with her because she's coming to work every day, when her hemoglobin was about 12, she can't go to work. Not going to answer that stuff. It's not going to tell us whether we should be not giving patients who are virtually frail and elderly we shouldn't be bothered with giving them anything. They don't, they've, they have, they're not going to get much of a benefit from that. Not able to pick out patients in whom we're able to provide clinical benefits. But we'll be able to get them all to a hemoglobin of 11.5. And we'll be as happy as dad, because mm -hmm. they're all 11.5. And I don't think that's good medicine. Okay, that's it. Over for questions. <laughs> Um, so open for questions. Thank you for that. That's a great provocative way and it's a sort of some of the conversations that we've been having as well about what is a number and uh, what are we doing and how do we personalize medicine better. So comments or questions? Go ahead, Mark. Uh, thanks very much. That was a spectacular talk, I think. Um, I could talk to you all day and hopefully I'm going to pick your brain for the morning. But one, one thing that we mightn't talk about because we're not, so we're, we're looking at this question in Canadian population and the BC population about what's been happening and has we, have we actually, you know, uh, put a dent in any of these outcomes through a more conservative pathway. But 
So we're, we're not, we don't have any data, obviously, on the HIF stuff. But something that did strike me was that when it was presented at uh, ASN, they pooled all the studies, showed all the hemoglobin improvements, and then said, for the safety data, we put it all together and had a, a clinical event, and they chose a non-inferiority design. But at no point did they justify the um, margin of risk. So the non-inferiority margin was a 30% increased relative risk compared to ESA, which has already been demonstrated, whether it's comorbidity or whatever. But still, if you give enough, you're going to see a signal for risk. So it's a non-inferiority margin to a therapy that's associated with risk. And at no point was that 30% uh, margin justified, as far as I could tell, unless there is something you know that I don't know. No, there's not. It's just, uh, I mean, when it comes to sample size estimates, you're, you're ending up picking what you can, what you, how you can answer it. So picking a 30% margin was what happened, I think, in the uh, pivotal study was the same thing, that they picked a 30% non-inferior margin. Um, it's the sample size estimate is what, it, what that's about. Um, so within that, within that uh, non-inferiority margin, you could have harm, right? You could, for sure. Um, and I'm not, I'm not really. Uh, I, 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 the treat data is convincing. You know, you got a twofold increased risk from of stroke. Um, the, the, the rest of the outcomes that occur as a result of uh, normalizing hemoglobin, for instance, um, I'm less convinced about. They're not consistent across, across trials, etc. So, I, I, I mean, I can, I'll be discussing your study later on, but I think that the only real way that you can look at uh, uh, data within populations would be to demonstrate that over time, the same types of patients entered into, you treated the same types of patients every year, and that the things that you changed are recognized, so you changed anemia therapy over the last decade, and that the event rates that occurred, occurred at this rate, and was there a difference as the anemia therapies changed, correcting for whatever else you thought might have changed. I think you can do that, uh, and I think you can get an answer as well, whether, whether the anemia management strategies I had any clinical benefit from a MACE perspective. So that, so that essentially nothing changed apart from mortality. We'll talk about it later. But, you know, what's interesting is that we are now, the, the prevalence of anemia, if you define it less than 90, or even less than 80, has doubled compared to 10 years ago. And while those people, while their risk has not changed in time intervals, like if you take a contemporary period compared to 10 years, in relative terms it hasn't, but they still have the highest absolute event rate. So we haven't yeah, done that's, anything. That's, that's, that's uh, kind of a total adjective. That's, that's, they've got the highest event rate because they're, they've got the highest comorbidity almost certainly. Sure, and that's the limitation in the type yeah. of observational stuff that you can't account for everything. Yeah. But, and well, I, just, I find but, it interesting but, that we haven't really addressed some of those fundamental questions that you talked about today. So, so I, would, I, would, I would say I'm not surprised, right? The, the, the uh, normalization of hemoglobin study, was, uh, our data was built in a bunch of, uh, on a deck of cards. So nephrologists in North America put the hemoglobins up based on no data, because they thought a high hemoglobin would be good, and then when they took, when they found out it was harmful, and they reduced it, I wouldn't be surprised there was no benefit demonstrated on a population level, based on the data we have. Uh, are there questions at VGH? Because, or anywhere else? Roll Julie. So can I ask a question about implementation? One of the things, or while I'm waiting for someone else to come up. Um, Sorry? One, one of the things that's interesting is I don't know that we have tools that we use. So why do we take a trial outcome and then translate into clinical practice? Because it's easy. I can keep measuring hemoglobin just like in the trial. So is there any effort to create a tool 
that measures quality of life that is implementable in clinical practice, which might actually make us take heed of it, because I think that's part of the problem. We don't care because we can't measure it as easily. Okay. So, so if you, if you, uh, if what you're interested in is, are my patients, uh, have they got vitality? Do they have, are they, have they little fatigue? And are they physically active, if that's your question? Which it should be for anemia therapy. They're the domains that would change. The SF36 questions are short, 10 questions per domain. Uh, they, I think, if I remember rightly, they got uh, f five choices. Then you add the score up, easy to do. Uh, and there's little doubt that even using the EDQ, which is the European um, um, simple Likert scale for EDQ, um, there's no doubt that you get major MACE events that, it, that you can measure change in quality of life, even with something as insensitive as the EDQ. So in the United States, they have to measure quality of life every quarter, but they just accumulate them. The social worker does it, and they don't use them. They've got a vast quantity of data that's likely to be good. But there's not a, there's not, uh, at least from what I know, there's not very many people trying to analyze quality of life in a sophisticated manner, because it needs to be sophisticated, because it's not that simple. In terms of the analysis, the reporting of it could be very simple, which you could say there was a clinically significant change in quality of life, right? And people would say, well, all right, I'll buy that. Then you can go and demonstrate how you made, what it is associated with, etc. But that data as well is, I'm trying to get the treat guys to deal with that and haven't moved them very much. Victoria? Um, I, don't know if you, I don't know if you can hear me. Yeah, we can. Oh, yeah, yeah. loud and clear, buddy. Great. Um, Kevin Horgan here. Really enjoyed the talk. Just wondered if, uh, about your comments about Pivotal and whether um, the issue of, uh, of raising hemoglobins with ESAs, if, if Pivotal does sort of inject a note of caution in your mind, um, because it, it uh, it uh, showed a, a reduction in, uh, um, in MACE um, when you used less ESA. It was the other way around, wasn't it? Yeah, you, you had a reduction. Higher, 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 doses, higher doses of intravenous iron led to better outcomes from a MACE but, perspective? Right, but also in that group you had less ESA. Correct, yes, I, yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, but. Uh, um, I don't actually believe that the ESA, the data supporting ESA as being causing MACE events are terribly strong. Right. I, I know I, what the difficulty is, is that a lot of these anemia studies is, is trying to break out whether it's the iron or whether it's the EVO. Right. 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 It's, it's, pre, it's pretty difficult. Um, in fact, I can't do that. <laughs> right. But I haven't, as you can get, I'm a, I'm a bit of a cynic in, in relationship to the data on which, it, on which it's based that high EPO is bad for you. It may well be, but if the data is not, if the data is based on biased designs that uh, don't take, that are incapable of taking a, a, account of comorbidity being higher in people who need higher doses of EPO. Okay. And can you just call, you started out saying that there's different kinds of patients, uh, non-dialysis and dialysis, and then we keep talking about one hemoglobin and one approach, irrespective of whether you're on dialysis or not. And so I would value your comments on like that's also oversimplifying. Right. It's got so the same so, number for everybody. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the the pre-dialysis group of patients, there's very few of them get below nine. Right. So. Uh, they, they, when they get to dialysis, they'll go below nine if they're treated. So their risk of getting transfusions is substantially lower. Um, having said that, the risk of transfusions increases as the hemoglobin drops in every group of people. That's just uh, kind of s simple facts. So I, I, I'd, I wouldn't have that much interest in p treating anemia, moderate anemia, in pre-dialysis patients unless I thought they were going to feel better, right? So if people, if people are coming to, into the clinic at a hemoglobin of 95 and they feel fine, well, why would you treat them?
Hi, it's um, from VGH here. I don't think I, oh, there I am. Um, I'm just wondering why you think there are no studies being done in PD patients. Um, the quality of life and the fatigue is fatigue, but the factors that contribute to that are different in PD patients versus hemo patients. And a PD patient might have improved quality of life just because they don't have to take an injection themselves every week versus like a, a hip stabilizer, which is an oral medication. So I'm just wondering, why are there no trials in the PD patients? Doing what? Uh, comparing uh, anemia therapies within PD patients? Right. Are the hip right. stabilizers in PD? Yeah. yeah. Well, I, th I think the reason is dominantly access to the patients. You can run a trial in dialysis units because they come in three times a week, whereas the PD patients don't. So it's much easier for them to get patients into their trials uh, than but it is But how is that different from the pre-dialysis patients then? Well, I, it's I, not. It's sure, not. I agree. I agree. <laughs> I don't think I don't think that. Uh, <laughs> I, I know, but I, I, I mean, there's probably. <laughs> sorry, I'm not blaming you. <laughs> uh, sorry, I'm not. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm, not sensitive, I'm not sensitive anymore. to sorry. Right. <laughs> but uh, about I, about, is there 20 percent of PD patients, end stage renal disease patients, on PD? Yeah, right. So, it's, so I mean, it's, without a doubt, it should be done on PD patients. That make you happier? <laughs> Very you minimally. Design the study. You can design the study. There's no doubt. You're, you're dead right. They're a different group of patients. You're dead right. I just, just want to make this one point about the quality of life. So in, in the older general population, the older cohort studies around the world have looked at quality of life in older people. And Rod, they've moved away from this um, distributional approach, like just dividing your estimate by the standard DVA, that Cohen's um, uh, statistic. And, they're, and actually have moved to say, well, you know, can we compare a change in a score and how that correlates with something that's uh, more meaningful? So that you can anchor a change in the score and say, okay, well, that change there for CKD corresponds to half the score that would be, say, a, you know, difficulty independently walking to the shop, doing your groceries, and being able to come home again. So you can say to the patient, all right, well, how much do you value that? Because this disease state that you have is sort of, this is, you know, just trying to anchor them. So they call them anchor variables. Yeah. Maybe that's one way to go, move away from the pure stats distributional and then to something like an anchor variable. Yeah. So they've tried stuff a little bit like that, the trade-off, um, what would you trade-off, uh, time trade-off stuff that they, they did that in the that Canadian study in 1990 and found no differences. And we're kind of had difficulty explaining it, um, but it hasn't been pursued. So, but I, th I think those types of things are what, what, you should, what we should be doing in these types of trials, because the only reason we're going to treat anemia, at least me, if they bring HIF stabilizers on the marketplace, will be to improve patient, how patient, patients feel, right? And if I, if, if I got somebody who got a hemoglobin in 95, I'm not going to put them up to 11, 11, 11 5 unless I think they're going to feel better. Because what's going to happen is we get thousands of patients in which we can demonstrate the hemoglobin has gone up. To what effect? So again, I'm, I'm, I'm would, would support what you're saying, that there, there, there needs to be, in terms of how you measure quality of life, there needs to be sophistication as well. And I, and I believe that the t window you've got is about six to 12 months in trying to assess an intervention. So if you change something, then you'll probably be able to assess it over six to 12 months. Then people integrate it into their, into their being, so to speak, and that's gone now. So there, the second year is, a, is starts with a, a different start point. Yeah, great. All right, it's after 8.30, but thank you very much for a provocative way to start Friday.